Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Donfried, for your invitation, ladies and gentlemen, for your interest on a Sunday morning, which takes a bit of courage, uh, and a lot of interest in international affairs. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Casolides, for a marvelous introduction. I very much agree with your overview of, uh, of uh, the, the interdependent world we, we live in. Um, I would like to focus on steps to reduce the propensity for political violence in the world. And let me begin by trying to visualize the kind of world we live in now and the kind of world you are likely to live in in 40 years' time, in the middle of the 21st century. The world of today is like the chairs you see here around me, um, six. There's a seventh place next to that chair. Uh, we live in a world of almost seven billion people. So one chair is one billion human beings. Next to this chair on the ground are 925 million people who suffer from hunger every day, almost a billion. Um, we don't meet them. Uh, even in, if we travel abroad, uh, we don't see them, we don't communicate with them, but it's one out of seven of us human beings. Two chairs are the absolute poor, people who live on an income of $1.25 a day or less. We don't generally talk to them, we hardly see them on television. Three out of the seven live in a very fragile, poorly functioning states with very weak or very evil governments who uh, exploit the, their own population, uh, suffer from what I call internal colonialism, um, where the ruling elite exploits the country for its own purposes. The West, the Western countries, who sometimes still create the feeling that they are the most important factor in the world and can uh, determine the global political agenda, is just one out of the seven seats. All the OECD countries together is about a billion. And then I add, of course, Japan to the West because it's part of the uh, OECD club of uh, 34 wealthy states, including uh, South Korea and uh, also Mexico, which is more a developing country and suffering from very serious internal trouble. Now, that's the situation now. Um, out of the three chairs uh, uh, reflecting fragile uh, states, uh, poor and bad and evil governments, uh, most of them, of the people living there, suffer from daily political violence. Contemporary armed conflict, I call it, because war and civil war are somewhat outdated notions. Contemporary armed conflict is a mixture of war, civil war, organized violent crime, uh, which always flourishes uh, in situations of very weak governments and civil war. Contemporary armed conflict also uh, implies genocidal campaigns and genocidal um, attacks, particularly on women. Mass rape uh, is the new ugly face of genocide, uh, as uh, we see it in African countries, as we have seen it also uh, in uh, the Balkans, as we have seen it in history, and as it happens elsewhere in the world. Now, seven places now in the globe. Two and a half chairs will have to be added. Um, world population growth uh, will increase uh, till about 9.2 billion people by the year 2050. That's a demographic impulse which cannot be stopped. Um, we often do not realize that half of the present world is younger than 25 years. That's the result of rapid population growth in the past decades. And this creates a tremendous 
population dynamic. And we could be happy about so many more human beings if they were uh, facing a happy life. The 2.3 billion people who will join us will join us in the worst countries. The poorer the country, the worse the government, the higher the population growth. So this enormous population growth means um, high child mortality, high uh, maternal mortality, uh, and uh, other serious problems uh, in the weakest countries like HIV AIDS. In uh, parts of Africa, life expectancy has dropped uh, to about 35 uh, years. And this does not really affect very much the overall picture uh, of uh, population expansion in the world because these very bad problems coincide, they correlate with a very high natality, a very high birth rate. So you can imagine that the quality of life in these countries is going down very rapidly. We know of the propensity to turn to political violence in today's world and in the, in, in the past. Um, we all were educated in our history books by the picture that war is the worst thing that can happen to us. Actually, if you look at the statistics, what human beings die from, war is not the main scourge of mankind. It is political violence of governments against their own population. And it is civil war. And these questions, these items, were not on the minds of those who erected the United Nations. The United Nations is a system to reduce interstate war. But large-scale politicide, including genocide, and civil war, and violent persecution of opposition, and marginalization of whole populations, like you see in some countries, uh, is something the world has not yet found the proper answers against. I would like to make a few suggestions on how we can reduce the uh, inclination to political violence. Let me start close at home with the European Union. I very much agree with the remarks Dr. Casolidas made. One of the best things we could do as Europeans is strengthen our external policy because the European Union could be an important uh, factor for peace building in the world. The European Union is already the major source of development cooperation in the world. 55% of all the funds come from the European Union, and if the European Union sticks to its promises, that percentage is going to increase. The European Union also has a style of a civilian power. It is not a superpower in the military sense. It won't become a superpower in the military sense. It has a message, it has a philosophy, it has a model of democracy, it has a model of negotiation. The European Union is the biggest invention and renewal in international politics ever. 27 countries peacefully integrating and cooperating um, with no attention to each other's military might. Every problem is negotiated and settled peacefully. And that, of course, is the crux. That is the crucial question, how to encourage in the world institutions and modes of behavior that seek peaceful conflict resolution. Now, in order to strengthen the role of the European Union, I think we need to move from the unanimity rule in external affairs to uh, qualified majority decisions, particularly in the field of development cooperation, also in rule of law promotion, in democracy promotion, and step by step we should I'm not advocating now a change of the Lisbon Treaty, that is difficult. We should, in practice, move to qualified majority decisions on our external policies. And also, to this belongs strengthening the role of the uh, permanent president of the uh, European Council. He has to fight his way upwards uh, by president, and plays a modest role up till now, but we need a strong representation 
of the persons who represent the European Union on the world scale, so that they are recognized as the speaking partners of the US president, the Chinese prime minister, um, the uh, Russian president and prime minister. Uh, you understand what I mean. Second point, uh, how to reduce political violence. Small arms treaties. The worst plague of human beings is the possession of small and so-called light arms all over the world. They kill 500,000 people every year. 300,000 due to civil war and war, 200,000 due to violent crime, accidents, quarrels, and so on. Half a million a year. This is the true weapon of mass destruction, but in slow motion, so it doesn't take it doesn't get so much attention as nuclear weapons or chemical and biological weapons, year after year after year. Many weapon exporting countries say it's not possible to curtail this, to put bound boundaries on this. They export weapons, they find it impossible to regulate the trade, or they have, like the United States, the rule that citizens have the right to carry arms, and they are not willing to do anything against that domestically, and therefore also not internationally. But it is a major problem. In the United States, 25,000 people are killed every year because of um, crimes and accidents with firearms. That is a whole small city, which is wiped out. So it is very urgent that countries come together to conclude small arms treaties. It is possible. It was shown by a number of NGOs which started in the 1980s. Uh, they advocated a ban of small landmines as they kill and maim 500 people a week. It was started by individual civilians. Some countries supported the position. Then one, two, three, seven NATO members joined this campaign, and all of a sudden it became a wave through diplomacy and politics. Forty years of talking in the United Nations in the Disarmament Committee had not achieved anything in this field, and then all of a sudden we had a conference in Ottawa banning all small landmines. That's in the category of small and light weapons. So it shows it's possible. And it also shows one should not wait for consensus. We should just do it. Get a number of governments together, conclude such a treaty. That puts the blame on all those governments who do not sign the treaty. And one after another will come and sign the treaty because they don't like the criticism of the media and the opposition in parliament. Why do you not sign this treaty? Regulating the production the sale and the possession of small arms. Small arms do much more than kill people. They upset entire societies. They upset traditional uh, family systems and tribal systems. A young man of 12 years old with a Kalashnikov is, of course, a terrible factor in his village and for his parents and uh, brothers and sisters. And in many African countries, you can buy a Kalashnikov for the same price as two or three chickens. So this is a very urgent question. Second point I would like to make, to make or third it is. When we talk about world peace, we, we think about international organizations and negotiations and mediation and uh, defense structures. It is very important that we reduce uh, rampant population growth in the poor, poorest countries. Why do I join from peace to voluntary birth control? There is a very important statistic which is ignored. The highest number, the highest risk of civil war and domestic violence and crime is in countries with 
a very high population growth and a very large segment, very large cohort of poorly educated, unemployed young men. Those countries also have the weakest governments, the greatest poverty, um, the least perspectives for people, and there the population is easily mobilized for violent uh, crime and for um, war and civil war. You can already see from the population statistics of a country its shape how um, large the risk is that it will fall into war and civil war. The countries with a balanced demographic situation and the more aging countries uh, are peaceful. Uh, so this is a very urgent additional reason to encourage voluntary birth control by um, information campaigns and making available the means for personal fam family planning. It is in a way a magic bullet because it also reduces poverty, it also reduces many serious diseases like HIV AIDS, it also strengthens the autonomy and human rights of women. Most women in developing countries get on average six children if they have the means to determine themselves how many children they get, the number immediately drops to three or four. That has a tremendous beneficial effect on the social situation, human rights, economy, political stability. And it is very strange that this very important area of international cooperation, um, voluntary population, uh, birth control, um, has not moved to the top of the agenda of international assistance. It could have an important place uh, in development cooperation and in the work of non-governmental organizations. And those who have done so have been very successful. Also in countries where you would expect a lot of resistance. And let me uh, uh, remove uh, an often uh, existing um, prejudice uh, Islamic countries uh, are much more open to voluntary personal population control than many Roman Catholic countries. So this is not a problem of one particular uh, uh, religion or culture. Uh, resistance against it is everywhere, but the resistance is from top leaders who are generally not uh, elected in a democratic fashion. The regular population knows very well what daily life is all about and how, it Im how important it is that the children who are born are wanted, will not be neglected, that there will be means for them to take care of them, to feed them. Uh, it is a measure, therefore, which avoids a lot of unnecessary uh, suffering. Then uh, my final point. Um, in the development cooperation that we are used to, and that has been the tradition of North-South uh, cooperation uh, insofar there is development cooperation because it is not all that much. Um, we focus very much on transfer of capital and economic uh, uh, knowledge. Its focus is on economic growth. What I put to you is that that is the wrong focus. We should focus on building institutions for peaceful conflict resolution, meaning rule of law. Countries which have a decent rule of law system do well economically because conflicts are settled by negotiation or elections or in the courts. Rule of law promotion means training judges, training police, encouraging human rights institutions, um, helping the poor with legal aid to claim their um, rightful possessions and settle conflicts um, peacefully, uh, particularly reforming police services is incredibly important because the police is the face of the state to most of the population. If the police is suppressive, 
brutal, um, discriminatory, uh, beats people, you don't go to the police if you have a problem. Research in many of the fragile states means that people try to avoid the institutions for rule of law as much as possible. And in those countries where these have been built up, people trust the state, they trust the government, they trust also economic institutions, they start to invest and build uh, for their future. So we should focus in our development cooperation much more in promoting the rule of law in the world. There are many possibilities for it. And the European Union, I return to the beginning and the points Mr. Casolidis made, is very well placed to do this because it has built itself an international peaceful conflict resolution system. Our states are rule of law states. Uh, we have uh, a high level of living and human development. People outside Europe expect a lot from Europe and they are always disappointed that we do not deliver on the expectations they have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fohoub. We now have an opportunity for questions from the audience. Arthur Westing. Um, I want to say that yesterday and today we've heard a number of very interesting and valuable presentations, but I have to say that yours has been the most stimulating and um, uh, the most important one I think we've heard so far. Having said that, I have two very small points. Um, yesterday, a number of times, uh, people referred in passing to a shortage of water, for instance, in the Middle East, or a shortage of food in various countries. There was an American ecologist some years ago who vehemently uh, objected to those terms, shortage of water, for example, and uh, coined a new word, uh, longage. He said, it's not a shortage of water, it's a longage of people, um, a play on short and long. So, and there's only one other point I'd like to make. Um, with respect to the Catholic position, the, uh, the formal official Vatican position on birth control, um, this in fact has essentially no actual impact on Catholic populations or Catholic countries. Take Italy or Spain or various other nominally Catholic countries and their birth rates are, have, have no connection with their religion. Or there have been some very interesting studies uh, in, <coughs> for example, in a city in United States, Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is half Protestant and half Catholic, and it turned out uh, that the birth rate in the two um, religious um, categories had absolutely nothing to do with their religion, but with their economic situation. Thank you. Um, as far as the shortage of water is concerned, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations predicts that by the year 2050, we need um, food production 70% more than now to feed the world's population. The growth in arable land is very small. Um, there is an enormous shortage of fresh water, irrigation water. So uh, I don't play with words uh, about shortage or scarcity or a longage. Um, fresh irrigation water and fresh drinking water are a very uh, serious uh, uh, situation, are in a very serious situation. We um, have a large segment of the population uh, in, in the world. Uh, I think it's about the people lying there, the 925 and the first chair, who do not have daily reliable fresh water for their families. Um, that it can be solved. 
uh, by means of economics and energy and technology, but then we have to make the necessary resources available uh, for it. Uh, I don't want to dwell too long uh, uh, on this point, but it's related to the world energy situation. Uh, we can create enough uh, uh, drinking water and um, uh, reliable irrigation water if, if we have the right energy systems. Um, second point, uh, you referred to uh, similar birth rates in Catholic and non-Catholic or mixed situations. Yes, uh, there was an interesting uh, um, research by a number of doctors published two years ago in the British medical journal The Lancet, which showed that the official position uh, of authorities concerning uh, birth control uh, had not much effect uh, on people's behavior. Uh, but that is um, not a consolation because um, in a number of countries there are stiff legal regulations uh, in uh, this field and if people are um, not allowed uh, to uh, use freely the means of voluntary birth control, they often resort, resort to illegal abortion. And the rate of illegal abortion and medical uh, accidents, uh, women who get maimed uh, or who die, is very high in countries where, the, uh, where abortion is not regulated by the law. I do not advocate abortion. I advocate good laws. And um, laws regulating this reduce maternal mortality. Uh, they uh, strengthen the position of women. And they avoid uh, a, a lot of suffering. So uh, your remark is correct, but it leads to uh, regulating um, all uh, forms um, of birth control, and I should say uh, abortion is not a form of birth control. It is an, an entirely different area than, uh, than voluntary birth control, um, but uh, it has to be regulated. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, lecture. I have, I very much agree with the point you made about the police. And um, speaking from my own experience, I've been to Kenya and Uganda. I come from Kenya, and um, you find that things that are taken here for granted, like knowing how which number to dial when you want to call the police, um, is not the case there. <laughs> if you ask people what's the number of the police, nobody really knows. Um, but I wanted to ask you, like, how would how would you, which steps would you take um, precisely in order to improve the police force? Because I personally think that um, a lot of it has to do with corruption and the need for corruption because they don't get an, a high enough salary so that they don't, so that they will have to resort to other measures like getting money from other people just in order to make a living. So how would you go about in improving the police force? Yes, yeah, thank you. I have two suggestions. First of all, in countries um, where um, war or civil war has taken place and uh, UN peace operations uh, to help the country uh, settle down and rebuild its future, there's often a tremendous shortage of uh, uh, qualified police. Uh, in all UN peace operations and also in NATO's peace operation in, uh, in Afghanistan, there is an enormous shortage of uh, good police for uh, supervising, training, reorganizing uh, domestic police forces. That's one of the best things one can leave behind uh, um, when you return as um, uh, United Nations uh, peace uh, force, uh, that, that you leave a decent police system. So that element in all peace operations, which always focus on the military side, uh, should be strengthened. Strengthen also the police side. And along with that, court reform, training judges, and prison reform. Most prisons are abhorrent situations. Secondly, in development cooperation, um, it is common to finance ports, harbors, railway stations, education systems. Why not finance 
reform of the domestic police system. Why not train these people, um, reform the laws pertaining to the police, fight corruption, uh, court reform, um, strengthen individual lawyers, giving regular people legal aid so that they can go to a lawyer uh, when they have been abused. Um, this is a very interesting area. It works. I shall give you an example. There was uh, a lot of inexpensive but uh, lasting legal reform assistance to Indonesia. Indonesia has gone through diffi very difficult times, but it got a strong human rights movement. The reformist mood pervaded politics. Indonesia is now the largest Islamic state, which is a democracy. It has had a number of democratic elections. Now, every democracy you can make critical remarks about, but it is a democracy with a freely elected government and parliament. And legal reform from international sources has made a tremendous difference. Uh, there are other examples. Uh, Mozambique uh, has accepted in the field of development cooperation a number of police reform programs. It can be done. And it is not that it cannot be done or that countries don't want this. It is that we, Western, rich countries, have, have always thought of economic development as building things, as material progress building and reforming institutions and the human beings that go with them uh, is much more important and much more lasting. Dr. Wolf, I have been very impressed with your address and I fully endorse most of the points you have elaborated upon. I would like if you could kindly comment on uh, the statement made by Mahatma Gandhi that there is enough in this world for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. Now, uh, we would recall that after the Cold War, many of us expected a reduction in the armament industry, but instead, if we look at the figures, did this not happen? We saw the manufacturing arm munition companies, the state getting bigger and bigger. And uh, when we think about the amount of money which each nation has got to spend on budget, defense budget, don't you believe that if we could aim at more peace uh, making rather than peacekeeping, we could save a lot of money and utilize this to get a better world. Thank you. Uh, undoubtedly, I entirely agree. We spend now on a yearly basis about $1,600 billion uh, on, uh, on uh, defense in the world. Uh, much of that is not defense, but is regime security. It is paying troops to keep the population silent. Um, even if there is no external threat to, to the country, or very little. Um, to compare, because these figures don't say very much, uh, the total effort in the world for development cooperation is 120 billion. Uh, so it is uh, about, uh, defense spending is about 14, 15 times as much on an annual basis. So a small shift into civilian structure building and rule of law building uh, is easy to finance. Did you say 120? 120 billion dollars is development aid and 1600 billion is um, uh, arms spending. Another figure, uh, now expressing it in human beings, if you add all the large armies in the world, uh, I, st I stopped counting armies with fewer than 150,000 soldiers. If, if you take all the large armies, 150,000 and up, 
you have 20 million um, military in the world, 20 million standing military, not reserves, not militia. If you add all the military in, uh, involved in uh, UN peace operations, you get to uh, about 150,000 uh, or, or less, depending on how you count the uh, operation of in Afghanistan. Um, it shows that less than three quarters of 1% of all military power in the world is used in peace operations. So it also shows it's not a lack of resources in the world that we suffer from. We suffer from wrong priorities. And that goes back to your statement uh, of uh, referring to Mahatma Gandhi. There is uh, enough for everybody in the world for people's needs, but not for everybody's greed. Uh, I do not like the word overpopulation. Uh, we have a misallocation of resources. We can easily feed the entire population of the world from uh, an agriculture area as large as Brazil, if we would use the best agricultural practices. So it's not that the resources are too small, it is that we do not use them in the proper fashion. And uh, basically, uh, poverty is not a question of lack of food, it, uh, it is a question of powerlessness. Poverty and, and poor drinking water is not having the power to correct this. So it's basically a political problem and that means that we should shift our priorities. So I agree with your statement. Dr. Viva, I'm afraid we've run out of time, but on behalf of the ICD and the audience, I'd like to thank you very, very much for your presentation this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.